Hey everybody, Bobby Medina here with my very dear friend and good buddy, Paul Barron. And uh, hey, our mission is to help trumpeters learn to play efficiently, combat the effects of aging and improve even if you don't have a ton of time to practice. And today we have a very special guest artist uh, with us. He is a Shagirl trumpet artist. He's a great trumpeter, a teacher, publisher, content creator, uh, originally from the UK, and he's been residing in uh, New York City since 2009. He's a private teacher, but he also is adjunct faculty at the New School in New York City. He's a producer of some wonderful uh, books and educational video content for Airflow Music, his publishing company. And he has uh, six books out and over 150 plus trumpet tips videos uh, over at his uh, website, airflowmusic.com. Uh, he's currently uh, perform performing it with different projects, including our Turo O'Farrell and the Afro Latin Jazz Orchestra. He's been a member of that orchestra since 2016. And uh, he's currently also leading the video editing team for their weekly Birdland show. And this uh, last Sunday was their 55th consecutive week of producing a 50 to 60 minute show of virtual performances. And we'll put a link down below so you can see that. Uh, he's the lead trumpeter for this uh, eight bit Big Band, which is a video game music pops orchestra. Uh, he's been part of the Blood, Sweat and Tears uh, trumpet platoon since 2017. Uh, he's uh, also lead trumpet with the Duke Ellington Orchestra, which he's uh, been working with since uh, uh, 2019. So welcome Brian Davis, and I'm gonna let Paul throw out the first question. Hi, folks. Nice to see you. Wow, that that was uh, that's quite an impressive list, Brian. I, I'm not sure uh, how to start or or anything, but I'm going to ask you first to back up to uh, your move from the UK to the US. I'm I'm curious um, what facilitated or precipitated that uh, initially for you. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Nice to be here. Nice to see you both. It's a and... pleasure. Uh, yeah, I've been really enjoying the stuff you guys have been putting out, and it's nice to see some some quality content being put out in the world since that's half of my life at this stage. <laughs> um, no, coming into the U.S. was precipitated by the fact that my my wife likes it when I live in the same place as her. <laughs> so um, always a plus, a, indeed. So um, yeah, she's from here. Uh, she's american and so um yeah we did the long distance thing we we first met well over 20 years ago when we were working together on a tour in germany um a broadway style tour we were doing 42nd street and she's a dancer and choreographer and teacher and what have you these days and so we were doing that together and we did the long distance thing for almost 10 years and so in the end we managed to get visas together and what have you and here i am new york city baby so um i was just kind of curious for you as a lead trumpet player you know and i think a lot of people are curious about this you know people that play the lead have a lot of weight on them especially if you're playing in a in a show paul knows this you know night after night after night week after week you know, you're on the road, or even now, maybe maybe it's you're not performing like that. But even hitting hitting it hard two three nights in a row uh, can be challenging, can present its own challenges. So, what kinds of things do you do to recover your chops and get things feeling good again, and get your get your machine going again? Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's that's definitely an interesting thing, and. I know that Paul knows it very well because prior to my moving here, the three, four years before that, we were following each other around on the road. We were. I was, I was doing the, the, the Rat Pack live from the Sands show, which is a, a Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis tribute thing, which ran in the West End of London for many years. And I was the road guy with that and did the European tour for several years. And then ended up doing the US tour as the traveling lead trumpet when we came over. So we would travel with the, 
with me in the rhythm section. The piano player was the conductor and our bassist and drummer usually and myself and then we did the the local pickup thing around the country so that was from i guess 2006 to 2009 and i bring that up because actually that's when i had to figure out really what that was to get it back together and recover because up to 2006 i was i I got put in this situation when we did the, the european tour prior to that I started off doing that tour on second trumpet and moved to the lead chair after a while um, when the guy was previously playing lead left. And on the European tour, we always carried our whole band. So we had a 15-piece band, and it was three three-man trumpet section. And But it was always our guys. So we'd go from place to place, and we'd bus and truck it or fly or do whatever. Um, but it was always our guys, and everyone had their roles, and the book was split. So I wasn't playing lead trumpet the whole time. I was playing lead trumpet about half, maybe two thirds at a time. But we had strategically placed past leads around the book. And so the guys would would play some things and give me a break here and there because that was a demanding show. It was two one hour sets and it was a it was a hard blow for the most part. And it was all those famous, you know, Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis things in particular are tricky very often. So anyway, we started the U.S. tour, and they said, we'd like to come do this. It's like, great. And they got me out there and said, oh, by the way, a new contractual thing. Uh, You'll be playing lead on everything. And if we find out that you're not, you're fired. Wow. Okay, good. So splendid. Let's do that. (laughs) Um, And so we got into it, and we got a couple weeks in. And I, you know, I played that show for a long time, but it was demanding. And so on double show days, particularly when the schedule put them, you know, back to back on the weekend, I'd be on my teeth at the end of the second show on the first of those two days. And then you're really up against it on the second day. And that got tough quickly. And I realized pretty early on that Earlier that year, funnily enough, we'd had a real busy spell while we were playing all the time, and I was actually commuting. We were in the UK, and I was close to home. And so when I, where I lived in Leeds at the time, we were in Manchester, which is the next city over, and it's about, I don't know, 40 miles away or something. So I was commuting from home every day, which was great, and I was there for a few weeks. And so we're playing the show eight times a week, and then everyone at home realized that I was back, and they were like, great, we can do that project. We've been putting off for a year because you've been away. And about 10 people did that to me all at the same time across the course of a month. And so I didn't get a day off. And I beat myself to pieces. My chops were in such a mess that, I mean, I, we've all heard the the uh, the stories that Eric Miyashiro tells about his days on the Buddy Rich Band where he'd take such a beating that he would, you know, even go as far as to glue his lips back together and things like that. Yeah, been there. Not proud of it. Wasn't fun, but sometimes you do what you got to do. Yeah, done that. You don't know any better, you know. Um, And, you know, this was 15 years ago. So, you know, I was still more or less young enough to bounce back, but not quite. And particularly not with, you know, 30 days straight of playing eight shows a week on the show and then rehearsing all day, going and doing someone's record in the day, taking a gig on the off day because it was close to home, all that kind of stuff. Played myself into a corner and really split my lip up really badly um, to the point where I was gluing it back together to try and get through and things like that. And it was a, it was a pretty shocking mess. And, but then I actually got three weeks off and I took that time and healed up and let it come back together. And then we started this U.S. tour and all of a sudden I had to play lead the whole time every night and deal with the traveling because our schedule was such that we were going backwards and forwards every two weeks from the U.S. to Europe. So I would come do two weeks in the U.S. Uh, We happened up in San Antonio, Texas, I remember, and, you know, then played someplace else and then jumped on the plane, went back to Europe, played a couple of weeks in Germany, jumped on the plane, came back to the States, did the next one. So it's not even just that thing that you guys know very well when you do that traveling gig where you just, you know, you show up and you've got rehearsal on Tuesday morning and you, you know, you sit there and you hope to goodness that the people who happen to be in this town know their business 
which for the most part they do happily, you know, but also occasionally you run into times when that's not the case. And, you know, you just got to get through and get the thing done and get on and get on with the show. And if you're dealing with that with jet lag and everything as well, um, you know, it takes a toll. So we've got a few weeks into doing that. I recovered from this lip injury in the summer and then in West Palm Beach, Wednesday night, we were on the show and middle through the second, middle of the way through the second set, my lip went ping. Oh no. And opened right back up the way it had been in the summer. And when I say it went ping, um, it made a noise to the point where we were in the middle of a shout chorus, it went. And the second trumpet player turned to me afterwards and said, what was that sound that he heard above the band? And they looked at me, what happened to you? Because I had blood like, running down my face. Because this had just opened up again and exploded. So that's the point of bringing all of this story around because it's a thing. You know, if you're not geared up to be able to deal with something remotely efficiently, playing a lot of lead trumpet like that is it can really be a problem. And it is for a lot of people because... So in terms of recovery, I mean, there's there's all kinds of tips for that that we all know, like making sure to take, you know, aspirin or ibuprofen before you go to bed the night before, making sure to stay hydrated, all that kind of stuff, just to give the body the best chance to heal. But in point of fact, what I learned is that Dealing with it afterwards, if that's what you're dealing with, then you've already lost the game. You've got you to get yourself into a state where you can prevent it from happening. And so that's really the thing. And so learning to play efficiently and just dealing with fundamental things like the fact that contrary to popular belief, you don't need to blow the trumpet. You know, things like that. It's it's bizarre to say it because clearly yes all right of course we need to blow the trumpet um you know being slightly facetious but it's not like we're trying to blow the walls of the proverbial walls of jericho down you know air has got to move and stuff's got to happen but if you're forcing that hard you're just expending energy that you can't afford to deal with and so it's about bringing that balance back so you can let the trumpet do the work as far as possible and get into a place where you don't hurt yourself in the first place. And I think you just hit a big, uh, hit the nail on the head for a lot of people because I think a major, a major issue is that people just overblow, period. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it. That's exactly what you're talking about. Now you as a, I think this is a great time to ask you this. I know how Paul feels about it. I know how I feel about it. But when you're playing, well, we feel like, you know, when we're playing normally, we're maybe, I don't know, 70 to 80% of our capacity. I'm not playing mm -hmm. 100% full on out. I mean, do you feel like that every once in a while you do feel like you need to step on the gas? But do you have a certain kind of mental process that helps keep you from overblowing? I mean, what's your what's your what's your viewpoint on that? Yeah, I mean, I again, my my, my shtick answer was has been the same for for many years now. Is that uh, whatever the gig, I I give it the exact same thirty seven percent. <laughs> and that way I'm always well within my limits uh -huh. um, <laughs> but obviously that's kind of a joke answer but yeah I mean you got it, it starts it starts with thinking in terms of redefining what your volume levels are you know the loudest thing you play in whatever you're dealing with should be no more than 70 or 80 percent of as hard as you can play that thing mm -hmm. that way even if the conductor's out in front of the band and he's going no, no 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 give me more then you've got something you can lean on and go well it's not going to sound pretty but the guy's waving his arms at me you know because you've got to keep the you've got to keep the boss happy as we know you know so if someone's out there and saying we need more we need more I've got it to give to you, but that's not where I want to be because apart from anything else, it doesn't sound as good by the time you get there. Mm 
it was kind of a sweet spot, you know, really in terms of the the richness of the tone that you get out the trumpet, which, you know, the loudest, best sounding note tends to be at about 70, 80% effort. And so, you know, if you make that the most that you do and get everyone used to hearing it that way, you know, for the most part, people aren't around for the adjustment. So you could just kind of do it and everyone goes, oh, it sounds good all the time. That's fine. But, you know, it's the difficult situation. My situation was I had to kind of redefine all of this and having injured my lip that way and it gone ping and I realized this wasn't a, a retrievable situation. What's it they say? The, the, the sign of a lunatic is uh, trying to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. Hmm. That's the, the quote somewhere in there, isn't it? And that's what we all tend to do. We just go, well, you know, I just didn't practice enough or I'm not strong enough or, you know, I didn't put it together in the right way. So if I practice more and I keep doing that, I'll get stronger. If I keep wearing myself down, I'll gradually learn to deal with it. And a lot of us, and I did it myself for a lot of years, a lot of us learned to kind of get into that mindset of playing that way. And that's just what we've got to get out of. We've got to realize that there's a different way to doing it and swallow our pride to a certain extent. You know, we all know what we're all trumpet players. We all know what we're like as a, you know, as a breed, if you like, mm -hmm. tend to get into that certain sort of machismo with it, where I've got to be the guy and I've got to be armed and everything's got to be here and woohoo, here we go. And, you know, it's, you've got to just get back from that and say, no, that's, that's not tenable. Like I can't keep, push into 110 percent i've got to wheel that back in and get back to a place you know where everything sounds good and everyone's happy and it doesn't hurt me any longer and in my case it was roger ingram who was the difference maker with me for that because that was the person i managed to access at that time um but that could equally be any number of other great teachers who are out there you know i know bobby you've had similar experiences with Bobby Shue. Right. And, well, he had you know, the same thing, the same affliction split lip on Buddy Rich's band. Mm -hmm. He told me when, you know, Buddy fired whoever was playing lead and he said, Shue, you play lead from now on. You know, okay. <laughs> He'd never sure. played lead like that before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he had to figure all this out, you know, on the exactly. job training, you know, kind of for him. I think that's where so, both uh, Eric Miyashiro and, and I, uh, you know, since we had heard the story of Bobby Shue, we both went, well, you know, it worked for Bobby. <laughs> We're going to try the crazy glue thing. And, you know, sure, it actually did kind of work. Hey, I'm going to shift gears a little bit, uh, Brian, and just ask you about your career now that you're in New York City. Let's let's say prior to COVID <laughs> when things mm -hmm. were sort of normal. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. I as I said, I moved here because of uh, because my wife's from here. And so that enabled the immigration process to a certain extent. And so I was able to do that. But in actual fact, at the time, uh, when I moved here, the intention was to put the trumpet down and never play again. Um, which is a surprise to many people, because I keep picking the damn thing up. <laughs> but it's... Uh... <laughs> but... Um... Yeah, at, at that time, having done the, the road thing for 15, 16 years in various different guises um, up to that point, I was, as well as all the traveling and all of that stuff, I always have a habit of finding myself into the position of being the, you know, the on-the-road subcontractor or the union rep or the, you know, Either way, I always find myself in a position where I'm the guy that everyone has to shout at every day <laughs> uh, when something's not going right. And so that really kind of burned me on the whole thing. And so when I had this opportunity, I knew when I moved to the States that for immigration reasons, I wasn't going to be able to work for a spell. So I took that as an opportunity to not work for a spell. And when I had the very last weeks of the Rat Pack Tour in the States when I first moved here, in 2009, we did a couple of things for Christmas because it was October or so when I moved here and I had three months of work status where I was allowed to work. And then I had a break of about 
six or seven months before I was allowed to work again um, while they process paperwork and what have you. And so, you know, I knew that break was coming, but I was a little unprepared for how much I enjoyed it. <laughs> and I started doing things I'd never done before. Like, you know, I moved here and we got married immediately afterwards. And I was able to go to dinner with my wife on a weekend night. Um, <laughs> you know, things like that that had just never existed before because I'd always been playing a gig. You know, so, you know, you get the personal life thing going in whatever way it's going, but, you know, you find a random Tuesday for date night because that's the only night you're not working or something like that. So this was, it was eye-opening to be, you know, in my late 30s at that point and come to the stage where I could say, okay, great. Oh, this is how real people live. <laughs> oh, we should do this for a while. This is good. And so at that point, I mean, I'd, I put the horn down because I knew I wasn't going to be able to do anything anyway and really enjoyed not mashing it into my face every day. And in fact, didn't pick it up for about 10 or 11 months at all. Wow. Put it away. And I was like, actually, I, I'm done. And I took a job when I was able to work again as a web developer because uh, computers have always been a thing that have made sense to me. So since I was a kid so that's you know something else I was able to do and I still you know in COVID age now you know everything is on the computer as we know but I had to kind of leg up because I was already doing most of it so I mean yeah once again it's a theme long-winded answer but when I started here the intention was to never play again but you know in late 2010 I got a call to go back and I was allowed to travel again and I got a call to go do something in Europe for a couple of weeks with Thomas Gange and when Gange calls you don't say no it's like you know <laughs> if Winton calls over here or something like that it's kind of the same thing in Europe and um, so you know I went I was like yeah sure no absolutely I can come and do that like I've just got travel authorization again I can leave great let's do that the tour coming we had the record release tour for the record we've done just before I moved so I picked the horn up for a month and was like okay what's this again how does this work and i knew i'd be all right because i knew the music we were playing because we've rehearsed it so much before we recorded it so it was still in there but that was interesting picking it up after a spell how was the, so the physical playing. ramp up to to feeling in good shape again how, how long do you feel like it took you to get back superficially about two weeks um, in real terms, in terms of getting stuff really back together and being like competent again, about six years. <laughs> um, but again, it, it was kind of spread out. So I did that and I kind of put it back together and I got everything working again. And, you know, I knew I had to be in shape because it was a Gansh gig and also Adam Rapper was playing. So, you know, you got to show up when it's those guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, a little, um, little pressure. Yeah. But that's a good thing as well, because it was a joy to go and play music again after so long. And, to, you know, go hang in Germany where I, I just love it in Germany. Um, so that was a lot of fun anyway, or well, in Austria, actually, but either way. And um, that's, oh, Dozens of German and Austrian people just cursing at their computer screens after I just said that. Wow. But... <laughs> yeah, you should see the chats coming in now. Oh, yeah, oh, I, oh, yeah. After they're going crazy, I'm sure. Delete, delete, uh, delete. <laughs> but, you know, so it was a joy to go do that. And that got me back in a little bit. And so I, you know, then was able to take some calls when people I knew from here were saying, oh, you know, we just need someone to do this rehearsal here and there. And I joined, I joined like a rehearsal band with some people who were, you know, some people were musicians by trade. Some people were part-timers who played, you know, uh, weekend warriors and what have you. And we'd meet on a Wednesday night and play some big band music and they needed a lead trumpet player. And so, and I, sub of the band years before when I was just in town at one time. So they called me and I went and did it. And I did that for, oh, I guess, six or seven years. I still did that band. Um, and that, that was a lot of fun and it was nice to just play, but I worked a day job and was a web developer. So I do odds and sods here and there, you know, bits and pieces of rehearsals and covering for people. 
and that's how I first started playing with Arturo Farrell's band because I was I went to a cover a rehearsal at the Union and ran into Seneca Black who plays lead with Arturo still now and we knew each other slightly from before and he was like oh you're here great um, I need someone to sub this rehearsal with Arturo and you know uh, all my people are you know either not available or no longer available to me you know as that can be with different band leaders at times and what have you you know so it was like you want to give it a go it's really difficult but i think you'll enjoy it you know i was like sure so i went and did that and ended up subbing with that band for i don't know four years or so before i actually joined and so it just ramped up in different ways like that i got, gradually got into it i the interesting thing with how the scene works you know here compared to back in the UK is that the hustle works a little bit different. So when you go someplace, it seems to me to be largely acceptable for people to move to New York and then start cold calling people and saying, hi, I'm a trumpet player. Please let me sub for you. And which is great, but I never quite had the stones for that because that's not how I was raised in the UK. If I would have done that, I would have got fired from a whole lot of things real quick and blacklisted. So, you know, it's a different situation. So that wasn't in me to do that, even though everyone said, oh, just call, you know, call this guy or call this guy and tell him you're a trumpet player and they'll, they'll have you and you'll be able to go and start subbing a Broadway show. And I was like, eh, it doesn't feel right. So I didn't do that for a long time. So it was a, it, it was a much more organic sort of introduction to getting into the scene. So I'd get on an odd gig here and there and get to play with somebody and they go, oh, we need someone to come do this. Could you come do this? And I did it by being heard rather than forcing myself into the situation, which I think ultimately is a lot better because it's people's choice then to call you rather than you forcing the issue. I grew up so, the same way in, in Canada as well when I moved to the U.S. And, and nothing against one, you know, style or Oh, well, no, other. absolutely. It's just different. You know, it's just it's different. Just... Yeah, we're just not used to. Uh, well, I always kid about Canadians. The first word that we learn is sorry. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> sorry uh, to bother you, but, <laughs> you know, that, that's not a, a great way to hustle for a gig. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, it's... There's a slightly, you know, there's definitely a self-deprecating tendency to the to the British as well, in that in that sort of thing. So it's, you know, again, I'm sorry for the imposition, but maybe we could do something, you know, <laughs> exactly. Rather than <laughs> rather than, ha ha, here I am, let's do this, which you know, seems a much more American attitude to things from people outside looking in. You know, and again, there's nothing that I don't think there's any right or wrong to either of them. It's it's just a cultural difference. Right. Exactly. And, you know, so again, here I go causing controversy in the comments. But, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying I'm right and you're wrong, everybody. It's just different. And that's that, OK. That's OK. I'm going to take some heat, too, now. <laughs> we'll spread it into Canada and the UK. <laughs> good, good. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, from there, I just got going organically in, in the city and I joined various bands and work got around. And because also I had a day job and I, you know, I, I was I had some freedom to go do things during the days, but usually I was free and I wasn't doing a whole bunch of stuff so I could be useful to people. And that's really where we got into it. Now, are you still doing a little bit of that? Are you still working with computers and stuff in that capacity? Not, not in that capacity specifically. I, um, I made a decision in 2016, actually, when I got asked to join Arturo's band as a regular, rather than subbing all the trumpet chairs. I, I was there, and I was there more than most of the regulars at the time because I was subbing all four chairs. Is Jimmy <laughs> so, Seely on that band? Yeah, Seely's still there. He's yeah. not been with us lately because we've been doing the virtual thing, and he can't really. Uh, play open home where he lives oh okay so while everything's been shut down he's been he's been a practice machine we've done a couple of things live together in fact we've got a gig coming up at the weekend and i'll see him and it's silly he sounds killing always yeah so you need to tell him hi for me i replaced him on ray charles's band very and, cool uh he's just a great great guy great player yeah absolutely no, 
Love Jim Sims. He used to drive yeah. around in this big old yellow Cadillac. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I've never seen that, but nothing. Well, that was in LA. Jimmy. <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, got started with that and the, into other things as people, you know. And usually it was like, you know, I get a call or the word the, the word would go out. We need a high note idiot for this gig. Who should we get? And high note idiot here. So. Uh, <laughs> That was kind of a thing that got me into a lot of things. And a lot of the bands I do regularly now, it kind of started off from that. So So I I want to ask you about uh, some of your uh, most often asked questions uh, with your Trumpet Tips uh, channel. You mean his airflow? I'm I'm sorry, your airflow, yes. Oh, the airflow music on, you know on what? the videos. Let, let, me, uh, let me just ask that question more correctly, and I'll just edit the other shit well, out. Well, he, he does have, t- you do have a trumpet. T- what is that airflow music, your your YouTube channel as well? Airflow music is the publishing company, the YouTube channel. It's everything. Okay. Yeah. okay. All yes, right. So let be. me ask that question then. Mm-hmm. So, Brian, can you tell us uh, the most often asked questions that you get with uh, your, your channel, Airflow Music? Oh, all the fun ones. It's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's wise man once said, there's no such thing as a stupid question. I mm. learned that there's a caveat to that. There's no such thing as a stupid question unless you've got a ch- channel about trumpets. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that's not fair. Again, I kid. But it's, um, you know, trumpet players, we're, like I say, we're, we're a breed unto ourselves very often and we don't always get the message. And so, I mean, obviously, the, the things that I get asked most about are, are obvious. It's how do you play high notes and what mouthpiece is that? Because, again, it, it, it turns into a cliche, but it's what we all get obsessed with. Um, but the the one that I see most often which I have no choice but to kind of chuckle to myself at at this stage because it happens so often and there is no answer to it, is in the comments on a YouTube video from a person somewhere in the world that I've never met before, they will say, would this mouthpiece be a good fit for me? (laughs) I can't tell you how many times I've seen that one. Wow. Wow. And and usually in one of the videos I've done about mouthpieces, where the whole point of the video has been, I play my mouthpiece because it fits me. And, you know, there's characteristics of mouthpieces which affect how they play, but it's not in the way that we usually think, and this is what I'm talking about. You know, that's, that, that's the crux of any video about mouthpieces that I think that I've ever made. You know, so what's the best mouthpiece for high notes? The one that fits you, but shallow cut isn't better high notes. It may alter the sound to be more pleasing in the high register, but it doesn't inherently make it easier to play high notes. You know, it's that kind of thing. There's those kind of distinctions and common sense things that I'm trying to make and just trying to get that kind of good information out there, which is the whole point of doing this in the first place. Sure. Well, and using that as a lead in, tell us a little bit about the books you have, because you have a number of of great publications there uh, that are both available as PDF files, uh, like ebooks, as well as hard copies, right? So why why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, some of your offerings there? Sure. Um, Yeah, I started out um, with Airflow Music originally just as a publishing company to put books out there, because I kind of half written a number of books over the years but you get stuck because no one wants to you know you're like how do i do this how do i get those out there yeah and once i quit doing the web development thing as my gig during the day it occurred to me that basically i'd just been doing the publishing job for six years i've been dealing with layouts, I've been dealing with stuff on the screen, I've been dealing with things, making things look right, I've been dealing with making text hopefully be sensible and make sense to people, you know 
So there's a lot of crossover in there. And so I had a number of different like exercise routines and things like that, that I'd put together over the years for myself and for my students over the years and things like that, that I was like, okay, I can finally actually do this. I don't need to go shopping to a publisher here, there and everywhere. You know, this was, this was the days before Q press or right around the beginning of Q press, maybe uh, when that wasn't, you know, the majority publisher in brass music at the time. Um, I mean, Mr. Quinlan over there has done a remarkable job in getting all that stuff out in front of people. He sure has. Hats off to him, you know, and your books included, Paul, which mm-hmm. are great. And, you know, so, but that wasn't, that wasn't a thing in quite the same way yet. Um, so, I looked at it and I was like, well, I mean, I could keep going to Presser or Carl Fisher or to all of these places, but they don't really seem that interesting. And so if I want to get this done, I might just as well get this done. What is it? It's making files on a computer, which is something I spent years and years doing. It's putting them together and you, I mean, the rest, like anything else, the, the benefit of, you know, coming from a musical background and any kind of musical training in any kind of workplace is that we've developed the skills to be disciplined about things and to think on our feet. And so if you don't know how to do something, you figure it out. And so that's what I did. And that, that's where that all kind of came about from, really. And so I was like, OK, if no one wants to publish this, I think it's valuable. I let some other people see it some people that i you know were in the know and i trusted and they were like no this is good like we would use this um so i was like good okay so if smart people think it has value then i should put it out i should just do it so i figured it out and so the first title i released was in 2017 when this was all still just books and uh, that's the combination drills, which are lurking over my shoulder in the back over here <laughs> in the stand, um, which is a series of scale patterns. Uh, the combination drills are designed basically to be something you can practice when you don't have a lot of time to practice because the combination is about covering your bases. So it's stuff that we have to play that works on a combination of things all at the same time. They're ostensibly scale patterns, but they're all in odd meters. They deal with a lot of range connectivity. If you vary the articulations, you're dealing with a bunch of that. You get into the versions where it's arpeggiations rather than straight scale patterns, and that's flexibility, so on and so forth. So you can, you know, if you hit one of those a day, you're going to stay on top of your scales, and you're going to stay on top of a bunch of other fundamentals and that was the kind of the initial idea and i put that out and you know it's trumpet books it's never going to be a million seller but it was you know I there might be a million have... in your cellar though well <laughs> that, that, that's the beautiful thing about figuring things out for yourself and also living in a new york city apartment with no space you work out what print on demand services are and so I actually just reordered stock and I have maybe between well, six titles, but actually some of them are for low brass as well as trumpet. So there's treble and bass clef versions. So I've, I think I've actually got eight physical books sitting in the cupboard next to me. And, and I've probably got as many as 10 copies of a couple of them, but usually I keep about four or five around. Mm-hmm. The demand is not that great for the print books, and also they come from Amazon. So I order them from Amazon as well, just on the on the merchant side rather than the the public side. So um, yeah, so they're available. The print books, the best place to get them from is Amazon in your local territory, wherever that happens to be, because they're available and they will come with Amazon Prime, and they'll just appear on your doorstep a couple of days later. Um, if that's something you're you're into from that point of view. Some people do like to buy books from the source, and I'm very grateful for that, because apart from anything else, the walk to the post office gets me exercise. And (laughs) um, so I keep a small stock around here for when students come by the house and for when, you know, people really want something mailed out personally. So... 
So Brian, uh, I'm going to shift gears again and just ask you about your uh, um, relationship with the Shagrel. Let, let's uh, let's let's put a cut in okay. here. Okay. So let me let me do the transition. Okay. And then we'll say you have a final a final okay. question for you. Okay. Yes. Back in the room. There we go. Okay, Brian. So hey, we're just about t out of time here. One more time. Sorry. So, hey, Brian, I know we're running out of time here, so I'm going to let Paul throw one final question out to you. Sure. So I'm, I'm curious about your uh, involvement with the Shagrill company. Um, did you help them design the trumpet that you're playing or tell us about the instrument itself? OK, yeah, I've, I've been a Shagrill artist now since 2012. Um, when I started going back to Europe a lot, um, that was the main amount of playing I was doing for a spell at that time when I was working the day job, but I would go, you know, a few times a year and go do short tours and things with people that I used to play with. And so I'd be back in Germany or Austria very often. And Shago is a company based out of Austria in the small town of Mank, Austria, uh, family run business. And they've been uh, celebrating their 60th anniversary, I believe this year, wow. uh, producing trumpets. Now, <laughs> Historically, they've been best known for their uh, German-style orchestral trumpets, the rotary valve horns, which are the mainstays of a lot of European mainland European orchestras. Um, you know, certainly the Berlin Phil always keep a section of a sections with the Schlagel trumpets around, and a lot of those orchestras do as well. And but they've been making piston horns for a long time as well. And the horn I actually play is the, the James Morrison model. So it's not one I designed myself, although this is the, the lead trumpet tweaked version with a couple little tweaks in different materials and springs and things like that. But I like to make it a little more lead trumpet centric just for slotting and what have you. Um, but yeah, I got this in 2012. I was on tour in Austria um, with three different groups in the space of about three or four weeks, actually, including Thomas Ganch, who's a Shagel artist of long standing, as the Ganch horn and the Killer Queen Flugel. Um, and I was over there and we were playing in St. Paulton with the, uh, what was I think it was the Jazz Big Band Graz tour at that point. We were playing a thing, uh, Big Band and Symphony Orchestra in some of the big concert halls. And so we were in St. Paulton and that's the next big city over from where Mank is. So a couple of the guys from the shop came by to the concert. They were like, what are you doing tomorrow? If you don't have to be in Vienna till the evening, come by the shop. So sure, I haven't seen those guys in a while. I first played at the Shargle Festival, the Brass Festival in 2008 with Thomas Gansch. So before I made the move and all that stuff. And so that was the first time I'd kind of met the guys over there and seen some of the instruments and got to know what awesome people they are that's the main thing for me the horn plays great and i play this horn because i love this horn the fact that they've decided to call me a shagal artist is kind of incidental to that um but they're awesome people and i you know i love the horn so that's the reason for that but i went over in 2012 and it's when this one had recently come out and they were trying to sell me on a different model i think you know almost with the prospect of putting my name on it or something but it, it was a bark copy and i for various reasons i i'm not into bark trumpets I've, I've never found one that i really liked how it played perfectly great horns just not for me you know and so i um ended up over there testing out these horns and i was like, testing out a bunch of things and i found this one this very trumpet that is in my hands and tried it out and i was like yeah that one's interesting to me Really? You like the James Morris song? I'm surprised. I was like, no, it's perfect. The thing I like about it is that it, it plays nice and easily upstairs. You can sing around on the thing. And also, if you go real gentle with it, it gets real smoky and dark. It's got a real wide kind of tone color to it. It'll do a lot of things. And so that's what really attracted me to it. And I've played it ever since. And they were kind enough to make me a shower artist and use me in some of the advertising. But they're great folks over there. And I've also got a rotary valve flugel, which is stayed in the other room, actually, so I can't grab it. But um, 
uh, yeah. And I've, I've been with them ever since. I was back at the Chicago Brass Festival last time they did it in 2014, which was, again, an awesome experience to stand up there with. I played lead in the show in, in the festival big band that year. James Morrison directed us. And I got to hang with uh, Andy Hadera from the VDR band in Cologne, who's, uh, again, a long-time Chicago-connected person. And, uh, yeah, and play with him, which is just a great thrill because Andy's the greatest. So that was a very cool time. Awesome. Well, Brian Davis, thank you so much for spending some time and sharing your insights with, with all of us. And remember, everybody, you can check out Brian's uh, work on his YouTube channel, Airflow Music, as well as airflowmusic.com for all of his publications. Thanks so much for spending a little time with us and for being part of our groups. We sure love having you and a continued success to you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Nice to see you guys. Thanks, Brian.